the title is uh, uh, Mystical Sociology and Turning Judaism Outward, uh, which are uh, the titles also of two books that I happen to have been reading while I was uh, preparing my comments for this uh, conference. Uh, that I found very apt. And I'm not going to read the paper, and there's interesting stuff in there, so read it if you haven't read it. Like, you know, you have to, you have to put in these shtadlis. Um, but I'll just try to share a few, uh, a few brief remarks. Uh, and this uh, paper is dedicated to the memory of Peter Berger, uh, who recently passed away and uh, who said, I thought it was very nice, that um, uh, the fact of my being a sociologist, for better or worse, does not exhaust my self-understanding. Um, we have uh, before us in this uh, uh, conference that we've been uh, at for the last two and a half days, uh, really a convergence of two different uh, attitudes or two different uh, methodologies and uh, worldviews, uh, and an interesting attempt to try to juxtapose them or bring them together in a, in a fruitful way. Uh, one of them uh, has its best expression, really, in uh, Philip Wexler's book, Mystical Sociology, in which, for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet, uh, he argues very, and I'm just this very broadly, and it's not fair to his argument, but in, in two sentences, um, that there are two things going on. One is that uh, we live in an epoch in which society has sort of run, the, the modernist and secularist narrative has run its course. We are entering, or have entered, a post-secular uh, uh, world of resacralization and re-mysticization. I won't say re-mystification because that has different uh, connotations, although you might argue that that's part of it as well. Um, and that uh, modernist sociology, which grew up under the previous rubric of uh, desanctification and secularization, has also run its course and is unable to provide satisfactory analysis of the new realities that, that pertain to this epoch. And that part of what needs to happen for sociology, with or without Chabad, I think he would say, or with or without Jewish mysticism, is that sociology will need to reinvent itself in such a way that it can answer or that it can accurately reflect these social realities in which we live. You might want to call it the spiritual but not religious age, although I have my doubts about that. But whatever we want to call it, that something is fundamentally different, I think is intrinsic to Philip's argument. And then furthermore, that Jewish mysticism, and Hasidism in particular, offers us not just an object of study, uh, but a source of conceptual growth that can suffuse this new sociology with different ways of thinking and viewing the world. Now, I only recently read this book, I'm embarrassed to say, because it's been sitting on my shelf for a long time, and I've known Philip for a while, so I've gotten bits and pieces of it. Uh, but, it's a, but it's a challenging and wonderful uh, book. And I only realized uh, how much it sort of runs in parallel to, to things that I've been doing, but as an anthropologist, which means on a much smaller scale. In other words, I'm, I focus as an anthropologist on sort of uh, reaction, interactions between people on a local level, and not so much the sort of macro structures that uh, Philip uh, is, is talking about. And, and that will have some repercussions in the different ways that we will think about this kind of thing going forward but I think that that will be a fruitful conversation. Now alongside that, you have Chaim Miller's recent biography of the, of the Rebbe called Turning Judaism Outward, which for my money was really the best of the recent spate of uh, biographies that came out. It was not too hagiographic. Uh, you know, it was not, not an academic work by any means. It was appreciative of the Rebbe. Um, but it advanced a thesis, which I think many of these biographies are afraid to do. And uh, the thesis uh, was that the Lubavitcher Rebbe's, the Seventh Rebbe's uh, entire sort of ouvre can be understood as a dedicated and consistent uh, attempt over half a century, whether the Hasidim were aware of it all the time or not, to shift everything about the insularity of Judaism and the even extra insularity of Hasidism and of Chabad and to turn it outwards uh, to, a, to a broader audience, uh, including different classes of Jews who were not part of it before and non-Jews, uh, and different languages and different modes of, of delivery. Um, and that all of that is not just incidental and is not just about proselytizing, in the sense that proselytizing means I accept the structure of the world the way it is, but I want more people to be like me. Uh, but rather is an attempt to fundamentally transvalue the nature of reality in ways that Eliot has, of course, written about very uh, uh, voluminously and very importantly. Um, and it's part of his kind of messianic revaluation of the world, we might call dira tachtonim if we're speaking a, a, a Chabad language, 
but that this argument sort of parallels very interestingly Philip's argument about what's happening within sociology and what's happening in the world. So it's the convergence of these two arguments that I think allows this conversation to be, to be happening. And even though I've been involved with this for, for a while and following the conversation, it's really only in the last two days that I kind of got my head around what Philip is trying to do and why the conversation makes sense on a particular level. And, and I think that's it. I think it's the convergence of these things, which is what makes the conversation make sense, but it doesn't prejudge where the conversation is going to go. Now, as, as an anthropologist, I have you know, just some methodological uh, things that I'd like to uh, sort of throw out. Um, one is that I think that part of what's happening also is maybe a, a, repro a rapprochement or a different configuration of relations within academic disciplines. So that uh, historically, the Jewish studies literature of Chabad was very you know, highly focused on intellectual history and on the uh, texts written by elite scholars. Uh, with relatively little interest in what was happening among the, the Hasidim, among, among the Amcha. In other words, uh, you know, let's, let's read the Mittler Rebbe's writings and figure out what they mean, as opposed to the reception history and how, they, you know, how they're used and how they're comprehended by the, by the people in the street. And the social science literature on Hasidism, which is much more limited, uh, has uh, gone on as if there's no intellectual tradition at all, as if, you know, we're just, uh, everybody's just a power struggle and everybody is sort of, you know, uh, playing out kinship rituals or whatever. And um, I think what Philip is pointing to and what my work I th has been trying to point to, and I think, you know, we're not alone, but it's, but it's not a crowded field, is the idea that those need to be brought together. And that you can't talk about Chabad, as, as Eliot said, I think he said, the phenomenology determines the, the, so, the sociology and not the other way around. This, okay, so I agree with that. I agree with that statement. Uh, but I, I, would, I would tend to define phenomenology a little bit more broadly. It was not just sort of what the texts say or what the Rebbe's wrote, but what the Hasidim do and, and how they understand what, what is going on. Which, you know, of course, as you know, they're, they're not all in agreement about, right? So it's a, it's a live social field with a lot of dy dynamism and a lot of internal debate and struggle about exactly what that legacy is. And to step back from this gathering and sort of look at it a little bit itself sociologically and to figure out who's in the room and who's not in the room, which disciplines are represented, which, uh, you know, zramim, which uh, streams of Chabad are represented and which are not. Um, you know, that, that's itself an interesting project, which I'm not going to assay right now, but it, but it ought to be done. And uh, this is not the only gathering of this sort, I mean, in which there are attempts going on to try to figure out how to make Chabad a, a, a language of, of growth or, or accessible to a, a, a much broader audience, to a non-Jewish audience, frankly. So this is one that is the TAG Institute in, uh, in England, which is trying to do something a little bit similar, I think, if I understand uh, correctly. There's the Aspen Institute in uh, Colorado. Um, there are a number of these projects springing up. People may know each other, but they're kind of independent. There are a number of these projects springing up, which I think are engaged in the experiment, how far can Judaism be turned outward? I mean, to use that expression, how far can it go without Chabad losing its kind of uh, soul or essence? Uh, there's a wonderful uh, work by a sociologist from Canada named Altglass who wrote about the Kabbalah Center and various Vedanta groups uh, and writes about how, how the Kabbalah Center in particular, in her view, sort of lost its, its uh, Jewish core in the sense of being a Jewish movement for Jews, by Jews, for the dissemination of Torah, and became something else, partly through its emphasis on one of the things that Philip wants to emphasize as part of this new epoch, which is spiritual technique. In other words, technique which is divorced from a particular cosmology, a particular way of life, the disciplines of halakha, and so forth. And I think one of the interesting things to look at in Chabad, which I won't outline here, but you can see a few examples in the paper, is the way in which modern Chabad, both in the writings of the Rebbe and in the travails of the Hasidim, have been wrestling and struggling with that very issue with no clear resolution yet. And part of the conversations that we're having here, I think, involve, to some extent, Hasidim, fellow travelers, whatever, trying to argue about or figure out how much can we afford to give, uh, to give in to the, uh, the, 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 the technique movement uh, in modern spiritual life. 
And how much is this really about Hasidus in the, in the classical sense? And you see that argument being played out again and again and again in JLI and in Chabad on campus and in all kinds of places, which is also an argument about the universal and the collective. How Jewish does it have to be? How much can it be universal? And you know, Shmuley Botech you know, had to give up his uh, Chabad center because of having a non-Jewish president. At least that's the public story. And, 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 and you can see this played out in many ways. I have a doctoral student. Uh, I had a doctoral student, Michael Carlin, who did a fine ethnography of a group of uh, Chabad shluchim that was trying to create a life coaching uh, center in which they would uh, bring in uh, shluchim from around the country and train them to be life coaches, which would give them an income stream, but also give them access to all kinds of audiences they didn't have access to before. And in that case, it fell apart. Uh, and it fell apart precisely because there was too much uh, anxiety among the Hasidim around how much, how, how separated could this be from Hasidus? In other words, in life coaching, when a, when a person comes to you and says, well, you know, I'm about to marry my non-Jewish girlfriend and I'm having this, right? You're not supposed to impose your values. You're supposed to help them to achieve the answer that they feel that they need to achieve. And the shluchim were anxious or, or divided or ambivalent about how much that was possible for them to do. And the ambivalence was such that the project failed, right? It failed to become a professional option. That's not to say every project will fail, but that one did. It wasn't, uh, they weren't able to get to the right, to the sweet spot of, uh, you know, remaining Chabad, but creating technique that could be kind of trans Chabad. And I think that that is, that is uh, you know, I taught JLI. And, uh, uh, you know, in one course where the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah of you, I think it was called, where the lesson was clearly about the first chapter of Tanya, but the text that they used was the Declaration of Independence. Right, all men are created equal, right, because of the nefesh elokit. And you know, you're saying they're reading this, you think, well, this is odd. You know, I'm sort of scratching my head because the first chapter of Tanya, as I read it, I never, I never thought meant that all men are created equal, but the nefesh elokit was something else, and it had to do with Jews and whatever, and tremendous anxiety around that question. And I think that what we're seeing, and and if you read the Rebbe's writings carefully, you can see this some places there as well is an endless playing out of this uh, theme. And I don't know how much the Rebbe felt that he had the answer and it was just a matter of communicating it, and to what extent he was kind of working as he went and uh, you know, seeing, uh, seeing how things worked out. And people who are greater experts in his writings, like Eliot, uh, can probably uh, venture an opinion on that, on that question. Now, as an anthropologist, I'm not so interested in trying to figure out what the Rebbe really meant. Uh, I am happy to leave that as an open question. And I'm very interested in what the Hasidim think, uh, or what they're doing, or how they're doing it, and in particular, how what they're doing shows the interrelationship between Hasidic ideas and social practice, and how those ideas and practice, which together constitute Hasidus, answer certain kinds of existential needs, uh, which people have, I think culture, is not just a set of ideas that floats in the ether, uh, but represents sets of answers to kinds of problems that different human communities have, and that this is sort of the way out of the dilemma that has afflicted religion scholars uh, between uh, 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 constructivism and, uh, uh, what's the word, perennialism. In other words, is there a kind of unchanging mystical something out there that all religions are struggling to express, or do we really just have different language games that can't really be compared with one another, individual histories? I think an existential approach, which I find also in Philip's work, although he doesn't use that language, but I, but I think it resonates there, um, is one way of trying to get beyond that conundrum. So there are different projects playing out here, right? There are a couple of us who are social scientists who are trying to answer certain kinds of problems in social science. And this is a, an effective or maybe a, a hopeful way of doing it. And there are people who are trying to bring Mashiach or uh, uh, promote the Dira B'tachtonim. Some of them are the same people, some of them are different. And uh, there are people doing more modest things, you know, like trying to improve education, not so modest, or, uh, you know, take care of the aged or uh, Tikkun Olam or whatever it is. And those three broad conversations, which are each inherently diverse, and inherently incoherent amongst themselves are now being brought into the same room to see sort of what happens. And what I view this conference as was not really a carefully planned thing. I, you know, my apologies. I, I know you worked on planning it. But I view this conference as sort of throwing a lot of spaghetti to see what sticks. 
because, you know, people were brought in. It's a very eclectic group. The panels were made up of people who wouldn't naturally always be in conversation with one another. We would, but not... Sorry, what? Deliberately. Okay, so it was a, it was a, it was a planned, it was Tohu, Bakalium, Shal, whatever, you know, I get it. Okay. So, uh, yes, I'll, I, will, I will stick to that. So, um, you know, it strikes me that this was a kind of planned eclecticism or a planned chaos in the sense that it's not obvious who's, which conversations will work and, uh, you know, how any of this can cohere. And I think that, you know, the decision to bring in also social entrepreneurism is actually the most ambitious of, of anything because it's one thing for the academics and the Chabad intellectuals to talk to each other, which has been going on for a little while and I think is a very productive conversation. Um, and, and I think we kind of know how to talk to each other, at least some of us you know, in the room know how to talk to each other. But then to bring in people who are also are interested in progressive schools, like, why don't, you know, where, where does it end, right? Stop the madness. So, so I, I think that these three prongs are, are, are inherently tending in somewhat different directions, and there's an attempt to just kind of get people in a room and, and see how to go forward. That's how I read it. And I think that's actually what's happening. And I think, I think it's, if you look at the conversations of the last couple of days, there are a couple of themes that have emerged that I think are the themes of the conversation to this point. Now let me just end by saying that I think there are some dangers or downsides to this conversation, which we haven't really addressed uh, openly yet, although we've hinted at them in different places. Uh, one is the problem of honesty and coherency of each of our projects, uh, which is that, you know, uh, Hasidim, in order to be Hasidim, need to be teaching Hasidus, and they need to be bringing Mashiach, and they need to be engaging us in Fabrengans and teaching Torah, and all those, I get it, all those kind of things, some of which I relate to as well as an individual. Uh, but social scientists and sociologists, anthropologists, and uh, academics in the humanities uh, need to be exercising our critical intellects and trying to uh, find the flaws in things, and the things we love we attack, I mean, you know, and, and, and all that kind of thing. And the social activists sometimes view both of these as sort of distractions because they just want tools, you know, go out and get stuff done. And that's also a tension among the shluchim, I know, right? How, how important is it to learn chassidus or just to like get tools and go out and get the job done? So we haven't figured that out. And I think there's a danger that we sometimes do fall prey to in this group of presuming premature agreement. Uh, about a whole range of issues where we should allow ourselves to have disagreement. And, and not just disagreement about the facts, you know, is it the klali or the prati, like, you know, that's sort of on that level. Um, but also disagreement about the goals and disagreement about the boundaries of the conversation. And, you know, who should be leading text practice outside? Should it only be people who look like uh, shluchim or, you know, should some of the more, you know, somebody without a kippah also be leading a text study? I mean, those are, those are valid questions. And I don't think there's a single answer to those questions, but they're questions that in, in order for this group to work are going to have to be talked about and worked out explicitly, I think, and not just implicitly. And that's hard because, you know, everything is planned by a small group of people. So to, uh, to conclude, uh, so that's one danger. And another danger is uh, at what point, if, if in fact it's true, at what point the Dira Batachtoni model and the mystical sociology model might just diverge. And what happens then? I mean, does that make the conversations without value? I mean, you know, how, how are they valuable? What happens next? Um, one of the things Philip does not talk about in his book, at least, and uh, we should talk about it, is uh, just as mystical sociology poses all kinds of promises and uh, challenges in a good way for the world going forward, of course, every construct has its pathologies. And, uh, you know, Spirituality has its pathologies, and Hasidus has its pathologies, and although it may not be comfortable to talk about it in a mixed group, Chabad has its pathologies. I know, I know. So, so right, and, and Litvaks, you know, are just all pathology. So, <laughs> so that's the Kedusha, right? We're broken, we know it. We have no, we don't we pretend. So, so I think that um, Going forward, um, on the one hand, we need a kind of more aggressively empirical approach. In other words, where you can just sort of, we shouldn't tiptoe. We should let things out. I mean, in my paper, you'll see I talk a little bit about religious violence and extremism is one problem that sort of is always haunting these conversations. Um, we, should, uh, we should let that flow. But you know, in order to do that, I think there has to be a, a, a sense of basic trust among the participants first that it's not about gotcha. 
but that there's a shared project of some kind and that there's disagreements, but the disagreements won't lead to the end of the, of the, of the intellectual community or of the, of the discussion. So I think the challenges are clear going forward. I've, I've written about it a little bit more eloquently than I have uh, spoken about it. Um, but it's, it seems to me clear that the next phase uh, it has to be moving from this sort of uh, you know, very broad, what are we doing here together, and just start doing some of it. And I think that that will resolve some of the issues, Mimela, whether or not we have an adequate theoretical justification for them. 